welcome. This is the Weirton Bible Study in, well, not in West Virginia, but in Pennsylvania. And we're glad you can join us today on Facebook Live. Um, welcome. I hope you're all safe and doing well. Uh, God is on the throne. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I ride, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my soul. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my soul. You are.
So thank you for joining us today. As you know, we've been teaching on the streams of healing. Uh, we've been discovering lots about those different streams. We know that God has multiple ways by which we can be healed and that we can receive healing. And as we've been saying, you know, we're living in a time we need to know about healing. We need to study everything that we possibly can about healing, learn about healing, apply that healing to our lives and share that healing with other people as well. But we know in the fact that God has multiple streams that tells us something about him. It tells us this, God wants you well. There is no benefit for you being sick for God or for you. I always said that when I'm sick, it makes me miserable and everyone else miserable around me. There's no benefit to you being sick. God's will for you is to be healthy and whole and live a long life. That's a blessing of God, and that's the blessing that God wants you to realize in your own life. So we know that there's multiple ways by which we can be healed. There's multiple streams, but in every stream there's one constant, and this is the one constant that there is, and that is faith. And we call that the ore of faith. We navigate every stream that we find ourselves in with faith in God. And so... Healing, we had a wonderful definition. I'm going to read this because we haven't read it in a couple weeks. But this is our healing. It's a literal, literal definition of the word healing, and it means this. It means to make whole. It's the process of restoration of health to an unbalanced, diseased, or damaged organism. Healing is a physical or it's psychological. You know, a lot of times we want to think about healing only in our bodies, but Many people right now are dealing with huge amounts of anxiety, huge amounts of fear, and we need to be healed in our emotions, in our mind. So healing is also psychological. With respect to physical damage or disease suffered by an organism, healing involves the repair of living tissue, organs, and the biological system as a whole, and it restores to normal functioning. So healing is anything that's not functioning normally in your body. God wants to restore that to its normal function. It's the process by which the cells in the body regenerate and repair to reduce the size of a damaged area and replace it with new living tissue. It says that the replacement can happen in two ways by regeneration in which the necrotic cells are replaced by new cells and form similar tissue that was originally there or by repair in which injured tissue is replaced with scar tissue. So notice in this definition, and it, it's a you know, kind of a lengthy definition, but I want you to understand that healing involves three major ideas, repair, regeneration, and restoration. That is the goal of healing in your body, in your mind, and in your emotions. So today we're going to talk about a stream that most of us may not think of, a powerful stream of healing, but it is. We're going to talk about natural healing, healing that takes place in the natural. You know your body in itself, and this is again a testimony to God's healing power is that your body is made to repair itself. Your body has white blood cells and your body has red blood cells. And, you know, when you cut yourself, God doesn't just allow you to bleed out. Your body immediately goes to fixing the wound, healing the wound, and causing that to be well. So, again, that tells us if my body is always trying to heal me, 
then mayhaps God made us and he's interested in us being whole. So God wants us well, and our own bodies are a testimony of that fact. But you say, well, why are we discussing natural healing? Because I find oftentimes in the body of Christ that people have a, a, an idea that either God is going to heal me or I'm going to be healed by the doctors or medical science. Like somehow the two have never mixed. <laughs> somehow if God, if God does it, then I can't have anything to do here with the doctors. Or if I'm going to the doctors, then somehow God is, doesn't have a hand in that. But there are, I find that in healing, there's always two sides like a coin. There's a spiritual side, and then there's a natural side. It takes both sides in order for us to be made whole and well and again, it's the idea that we'll always have that or of faith. You know, when I was a little girl, I was convinced that my grandfather was the richest man that ever lived. And the reason why I knew that is on the top of his high boy dresser was jar after jar after jar of millions and millions of coins. Pennies, dimes, nickels, quarters, and even half dollars. They were overflowing. In fact, there was no room for anything else but just mason jar after mason jar filled with coins. And my grandfather never let us leave his house unless he gave us each a baggie and he filled up those baggies with coins. And I was convinced that I was going home with a fortune in my hand. You know, today in our society, coins are almost obsolete. Um, they're sort of meaningless. In fact, when we were children, we had our nose stuck to the ground. You know, stuck to the ground. <laughs> we had our eyes down when we walked because we were scouring, scouring to find a dime, to find a quarter, a nickel. Somebody had dropped something. It was valuable to us. Of course, today, if you see a, a coin on the ground, you don't want to touch it. It may, may have a virus on it. <laughs> but you know, with with there being payments online and credit cards. We often, we kind of think that coins have sort of become a thing of the past. You know, I remember when my daughter was six years old and I asked her what she wanted for Christmas, she pointed to my Visa card and she says, I want one of those. She was used to me taking that and putting that in that machine and then out came the money. I want one of those too, don't you, that a card that you just put in and the money just comes out all, like magic all the time. Amen. Praise God. But the Bible has lots of examples about coins. It talks about the parable of the lost coin. It also talks about the woman who put in two mites in the treasury where Jesus was watching. And it also tells us, too, when Jesus was being trapped by the Pharisees, he told them to render unto Caesar what belonged to Caesar and to render unto God what belongs to God. But I want to talk about this two sides of the coin because in any situation where you're asking of God, where you're seeking of God, whether it is your finances, whether it is for your physical body, whether it's in relationships, anything we're looking for a breakthrough, you're always going to deal with the natural side of things and you're going to deal with the spiritual side of things. Well, a coin is a piece of metal that's stamped and it's issued by the authority or the government for use as money. The authority ensures the purchasing power that's impressed on the coin. And you notice most coins, or really all coins, have two sides that are impressed. And if you don't have both sides impressed with an image, then you cannot do transaction or you cannot barter or, you know, make a purchase that has no power if the coin is not impressed on both sides. So in this idea and in this fact, in anything that we're seeking God, we are going to deal with two sides of things, the natural side and the spiritual side. Well, Jesus, in a discussion with Peter, uh, came up one day, there was a question that arose about Jesus himself paying taxes. So we're going to look at this in Matthew 17, and even in the area of a financial breakthrough, and I know we're talking about streams of healing, but I just want you to see how Jesus himself often dealt in the natural realm and not, it wasn't all spiritual. Jesus himself ministered 
natural ways for healing, and I'll, we're going to see this. But here we're going to look at a financial breakthrough. All right, Matthew 17, verse 22. It said, when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not offend them, go to the lake Throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours. Well, this is a very interesting story, and I think the part I, we need to note first off is that Jesus was reminding his disciples of the trial that was to come. And all the time we see Jesus is preparing them for what they're about ready to face. Because think about it, Jesus was with them, everything's going great, we see miracles, crowds are coming, we're multiplying loaves and fishes. And then there's coming a time where our leader, who we think in our own natural mind is going to be an earthly leader right now, is going to die on a cross and Everything will seem to be gone and lost. And I was thinking, I was reading this today, that this is kind of dealing with the time that we're in. Everything was going fine. We were going to the movies. We were kissing friends and hugging people. And then all of a sudden, whether we liked it or not, our world has changed. But do you notice that Jesus was preparing them? And can I say, even may, it may not feel like it, you may feel like, oh, this thing caught us out of nowhere I would guarantee to tell you that God has been preparing us for this time. God has putting the word in our hearts. God has the Holy Spirit here. He's preparing us and making us ready for this very time that we're living in. And so here we go. Here comes someone questioning Jesus about their ministry. Well, you know, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? And isn't it, this is another sign of the miraculous Peter doesn't come out and even ask Jesus about this task. Jesus reads his thoughts. It says Jesus answering his thoughts. So by the Spirit, Jesus already knew about what had taken place with Peter. And he asked him, from who do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their sons or from others? And Peter answers, from others. So the, even the kings of the earth don't tax their own family. Don't tax their sons. They, they taxed others. And so Jesus, reemphasizing the answer, um, says to him, yes, sons are exempt. Well, we know that Jesus is the son of God. <laughs> and the temple, the tax by which they were trying to extract from him, which was supposed to be for the temple, I mean, the temple was built for Jesus <laughs> The temple itself was to glorify Jesus, who is the Son of God. How silly to expect Jesus to pay the tax. No, he didn't have to pay this tax. And he was also preparing himself to be sacrificed for all the sins of the world. Talk about an offering. He was making an offering, preparing himself to be an offering of his very life. And so, of course... He wasn't obligated in any way, spiritual and even really natural, to pay the tax. But notice what Jesus says. Jesus, even though he's the son of God, lived in a very natural world. He still had to do natural things involving the society that he was a part of. And what does Jesus say? Now, this kind of leapt off the page to me right now. So as not to offend them. 
Jesus obeyed a law that did not apply to him. Why? Because he did not want to offend them. And I think right now, you know, I have a lot of friends that are pastors and ministers and church leaders, and there's a bit of a controversy because with the virus and the laws changing and limiting us coming together, there's this idea of, well, you know, really, they don't have any right. You know, we, we should freely be assembled. Yes, that aspect is sort of true, but as not to offend them. If we say, we're going to meet anyways, we don't care what the laws say. If we offend the very people that we're called to minister and reach the gospel with, what have we gained? So we need to use wisdom in these times. We need to walk in love, and maybe walk in love right now is not coming together. Walking in love is honoring and respecting and obeying a law so as not to offend others. So this is just a thought for right now. Amen. And so here he is. So he's instructed Peter to go about, and here we have a problem. We have a, a you have a two drachma tax. I have a two drachma tax. How are we going to pay it? And so Jesus begins to give him uh, instructions to do something very natural. We all know there's nothing spiritual about paying taxes, is there? <laughs> You know, in any challenge that we face, I find that people will be in two different camps. The one camp is, God is going to solve all my problems. I'm just going to pray, and supernaturally, it's just going to come to me. You know, a raven's going to fly over my house, and he's going to drop bread down to feed me. You know, and God can do that. I'm not saying that he can't. But there are those who think that only the power of God is going to answer my problems. But then there's those on the other side. That only natural means I will only go to the doctor. I can only take medication. I can only go, you know, and seek counseling. And, and they think it's, um, they think that they don't even begin to think to ask God to be involved in their healing process. Well, it's not one or the other. We find that in this natural stream, it's the power of God and it's the natural things as well. Remember, your coin has to be impressed on two sides in order for a transaction to take place. So let, let's look at this story, and you'll see there's an interweaving of the natural and the spiritual. All right, first thing, go get a fishing pole. Very natural for a fisherman like Peter to have a fishing pole. Number two, uh, have the commercial fisherman go fishing. I guarantee you that if anybody knows how to catch a fish, it's Peter. Very natural. Having someone drop a four drachma coin into the water. Somewhat, we don't know who he is. It's not mentioned here in the word of God. But somewhere along the way, somebody had to drop in a coin. And so, again, very natural. Maybe they probably didn't know why they were doing it, but maybe a coin fell out of somebody's pocket into the water. All right, so here's another aspect. <laughs> Having a fish swallow a foreign object, keep it in its mouth, and then find Peter's exact hook and bite on it at just the right time, now that's supernatural. That's supernatural. And of course, taking that fish, opening its mouth, finding that four of drachma to coin, and paying taxes, extremely natural, extremely natural. And so I, I share this with you in that you can see that in many things when we're praying, asking God, seeking the Lord, that we can see the spiritual, the supernatural at work, but we also see the natural work as well. If you do not recognize that there's two sides of the coin in any situation, it can cause you sorrow, disappointment, and even death if you're not careful. Luke 14, 28 says, But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? You know, I believe in anything that we're facing, and even in our natural healing, even in our healing, 
we need to ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do? Sometimes we just walk into the doctor's office and he goes, okay, we're going to sign you up for surgery. We're going to do this and this. And we just say yes, 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 yes to everything. Well, we, I believe what God wants us to do is to seek him, ask him, say, God, what would you have me to do? Should I have the surgery? Should I take this medicine? You know, maybe if one person takes a medication and they do just fine, another person takes it and it's not really working for them or it's not healthy for their bodies. That's why we seek the Lord and have faith in God even in natural things. All right, a natural comforter. John 19. John 19, 25 through 27 says this. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Now Jesus here is um, being sacrificed on the cross and there is his mother. And his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, and that was John, standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. I don't think anything is more traumatizing to a person than to see their own child suffer in the way that Jesus suffered and to die. And you realize that Mary was probably 13 to 16 years old when she had Jesus. Jesus is passing away now at 33. She was a kid having a kid. And they grew up together. They really grew up together. And she, you know, I imagine, you know, Jesus and her had a very close relationship. We see that over and over again. You know, uh, we don't, we know about Joseph. We know that Joseph was in the story when he was an infant, but we don't hear much about him. It's thought that Joseph had passed away because we don't hear much about him when Jesus got older. But I couldn't imagine, I don't know about you, but how devastating to see her son suffer like that in such a brutal and agonizing way. Now, Jesus, who's dying on the cross, he knows, he knows that he will be raised from the dead. He knows that God is going to send to the earth the Holy Spirit. He knows that the Holy Spirit, who is called the great comforter, the counselor, the provider, is going to come and fill the believers. He knows that his mother will one day be in an upper room. He knows that his mother is going to be filled with the powerful Holy Spirit and she will have comfort beyond measure, yet still Jesus, dying on a cross, gives her a natural comforter in the disciple of John. Even though he knows the Holy Spirit's going to come, even though that we know the Holy Spirit is well able to comfort, to provide, the Holy Spirit can provide, We know all these things he knows, and yet still he gives her a natural comforter. You know, there are those that don't mind taking natural medications, but when those medications are applied to our emotions, maybe our our mental state of health, we go, oh, we can't do that, you know, because it's it's not like a regular medicine that's just working on my body. If it's working on my mind. That can't be God. Only God can touch and heal my mind. Or, or maybe resist even going to see a counselor because after all, you know, God can straighten me out. But even still, if you take an iron pill because you're low on iron and your body is lacking iron, what difference is it if your body is lacking elements to help you emotionally and you take something to replace that level in your body so that you can begin to feel better. I think of medication like this. Medications will help us at times, and particularly when it comes to mental health medications, medications that deal with your emotions, sometimes we need those things to help us, put us in a place where we can start believing God and our faith will arise. I have met people that have been so low with depression and oppression. The medication stabled them to a point where they could start receiving from the Spirit of God. They could start believing and speaking God's Word. So we see that even in this, uh, God himself saw the need for his mother to have a natural comforter. 
And, you know, I'm sure on that day of Pentecost, when Mary was filled in that upper room, that she was fully restored to joy overflowing when she got filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I remember years ago meeting a saint of God, and um, she had a, a terrible gambling addiction. And she struggled and struggled for years. And I would encourage her. She'd call me and very upset, and I'd encourage her. There's many groups out there that will help you with addictions and even gambling addictions, groups, psychiatrists, psychologists that you can go see. No, 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 I'm not going to go. She's, God is going to heal me, God and God alone. And, you know, because of that stubbornness, she was like the woman with the short leg who kept going on a walk and wondered why that she always ended up in the, in the same spot. If you... Sometimes if you find yourself going round and round and round again, then you need something to break your cycle. You need something. Sometimes it may be something very natural. It may be medication. It may be counseling to get you out of the, the power of the enemy and the addiction. All right, a natural ointment, John 9. It says, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world... I am the light of the world. And when he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the man with clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Salome, which is translated sent. And so he went and washed, and he came back seeing. Again, I think this is a really interesting scripture, even for the time that we're living in now. Notice what they asked Jesus. You know, I think it's sort of a, a, a natural tendency of mankind that when something happens, we always want there to be a reason why. Something bad happens. What happened? Why? Why? And here they are asking Jesus that they were convinced that sin was involved in this blindness. They were convinced that sin was, is, you know, was a result, the result of someone's sin was that this man was born blind. And they go, who was it, Jesus? Was it the parents? Was it the man himself? And notice what Jesus says. I love this. I love what Jesus says. It was neither. You know, right now we have coronavirus all through the globe. And there's a lot of questions in our heart. Was it the nations who sinned? You know, was it, uh, was it the older generation? Was it the younger generation? Was it this nation, that nation? I like what Pastor Billy Burke says. I got a chance to watch him on Facebook, and he was saying, there's a snake in the woodpile. And right now we're all asking, how'd the snake get there? Did someone put the snake in the woodpile? Did the snake crawl into the woodpile? He says, that's not the important question right now, is how do we get rid of the snake? That's what we need to do right now. But notice this, Jesus says, no one. And, you know, sin is just sin and sickness. Sickness is in a world. We're in a fallen world. Adam and Eve fell from God and released into this world sin and sickness and disease. And we know that Satan is the enemy, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But notice what Jesus said about this blind man. Neither the parents sin, nor did this man sin, but that God will be glorified. In other words, what Jesus was saying, what the devil meant for evil, God himself will turn around for good. You know, several Roman writers and Jewish rabbis considered saliva to be a valid treatment for blindness. Since people of that day had a high view of saliva's healing properties, Jesus used his spit to communicate his intention to heal. And those being healed would have naturally interpreted Jesus spitting 
as a sign that they soon would be cured. So once you think about it, Jesus is a man. He's operating as a man anointed by the Holy Ghost. We know he's the Son of God, but in the earth, the Bible says he laid aside his glory to come humbly. He was a man. He was 100% man. He's 100% God. In order to represent us, he had to be man. And so he's operating as a man anointed by the Holy Ghost. So Jesus would only have the thinking and views of the age he lived in. He would only have the knowledge of, that he received at that time growing up as a man in, you know, in Israel at the time that he did. He didn't possess all knowledge. Otherwise, as a carpenter, I'm sure he would have invented power tools. But he didn't have that knowledge. He didn't live in that age. He didn't live in that time. So Jesus applying that spitting and that topical salve on the eyes of that man, Jesus was using a natural element to initiate a supernatural end. And a lot of times I think some of you feel guilty at times. Oh, I, I had to go to the doctor or I took medicine. You, you feel guilty like you don't have enough faith. Listen, you're taking a natural element to lead to a supernatural end, and that's your healing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus literally said that he was the light of the world. And I want you to think about why. I wonder why Jesus you spit. I mean, other times he would lay hands on them. Other times he would speak the word. But for this man, he felt a need to employ this natural element. Why? Think about it. This man was born blind. He never saw another person healed. He never saw it. He couldn't imagine it. His faith is, is, is at a low level because he didn't see it. He couldn't imagine it. He couldn't believe it because all he knew was darkness. He didn't even know what light could be. It's not like someone who had their sight and then they lost their sight. This is somebody who never, ever had any ray of light coming into their spectrum. And so Jesus, think about this. He would have to hear Jesus spitting. <laughs> You know, and I believe Jesus gave a good gusto when he spit, not just a little spit, but I mean, I believe he got it all in there. <laughs> and he spit because he had to. He had to make the paste. You got to put a lot of spit into mud to make a paste. He literally had to make a paste out of that. So the man heard Jesus spit, and then he felt this on his eyes, and he felt it. And it was a point of contact. We talked about that last week. It became a point of contact right here, right now. My healing is starting right here, right now. Jesus put his spit on my eyes right here, right now. And then he told him, go and wash, which is an act of obedience. And we told you, and many times the Lord will give us little acts of obedience to walk out our faith. And he went and he washed and he was healed I remember, and I love this because Jesus calls himself the light of the world. And guess what was the first thing this man saw? The light of the world. He opened his eyes, and there was Jesus. Amen. There was a woman once I met. I, I, I didn't meet. I, I heard about her. She lived in a town. I lived in, I lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they found cancer cells in her mouth. And, of course, you know, we all... We all were taught on how to speak the word and believe God and ask God for our healing. Uh, you know, we, we've been told many things we, about calling elders and being anointed with oil. And uh, this woman refused to go to the doctor. The doctor, they found these cells, and they wanted her to come back in, and they wanted to do a simple procedure, and um, she refused. I'm not going to do that. God, only God, is going to heal me. I believed, I believed, I believed. Well, this, these little cells became more cells and became more cells. And eventually this thing turned into a large tumor. And the sad thing about it, that this woman ended up passing away from just those few cells that had multiplied and multiplied in her mouth. And this did not have to happen because there was a natural way to deal with the cancer. 
And what I say this is, if you're in a certain stream, maybe you are believing God and you're trusting the Lord. But if things are not advancing and things are not changing, you need to get out of that stream and you need to get into another stream. Or you need to ask God, God, what do I do from here? How do I receive from you? So you can ask God to heal you, but you cannot dictate to him how he'll do it. You can't dig your heels in. Don't dig your heels in. Yes, confess God's word. Yes, believe God's word. Yes, trust in the Lord. But don't dig your heels in and say, well, I'm never going to do thus and thus. You need to be humble and allow God to speak to you. All right. 2 Kings 5. 2 Kings 5. It says this, verse 9. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. Now, Naaman was a leper from Syria. And he had a servant girl who was from Israel, and she told him all about this prophet that healed people. And Naaman, who was very sick with leprosy, decided to go visit the prophet. Verse 10, and Elijah sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious. He was mad. He was hopping mad. And went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. I think it's interesting that Naaman was offended that his healing was too natural for him. It was just too natural. Because you know as well as I do that the whole time that he was riding up to Israel on his chariot or his horses, he imagined how this was going to take place. You know, he wanted the trumpets. He wanted the angels singing. He wanted the prophet to speak to his God and to wave his hand. We all love that. I mean, I'm sort of a fireworks girl too in the spirit. I love fireworks. I love to see people slain in the spirit. I love to see the power of God come. But sometimes God comes in that still small voice. Sometimes healing is just so natural. It just takes place. And in, in, in it's not this big fanfare. I remember one time I was sick and... Um, I asked my husband to pray for me. It was in the middle of the night. And uh, I woke him up and I said, honey, I don't feel well. Would you please pray for me? And he was tired and he just sort of rolled over and he laid his hand on me and said, God healer. And he went right back to sleep. And I said, really? That's it? That's it? That's all you have for me? That's it? God healer? I mean, I wanted there to be passion and I wanted there to be fervency. And, you know, I think we think if we're more dramatic, God's going to heal us. But sometimes... God's instructions to us seem very natural and very simple. And this was very simple. Go and wash. And so I love it. You know, if the, if the prophet had asked you to do something complicated, you would have done it. How much more? This is just a simple thing. This is just a simple thing. And again, we see in that go and wash, go and wash, that... Um, you know, dipping the seven times. It wasn't six times. It wasn't five times. It wasn't three times. Seven times. On the seventh time, he was completely healed. And, that, and Jesus all the time was telling them, go show yourself to the priest. Remember the ten le- lepers that came to him. You know, go show yourself to the peace, priest. And as they went, they were healed. Those little simple, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Even in going to your doctor, going to your surgeon, going to your therapist, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and obey that still, small voice. You know, our secretary, who works here at Berean Fellowship, had a very big trial a couple years ago. She had just come back from a Disney trip, and she was, happened to be in the shower, and 
she had noticed that a small, tiny, tiny, like the pea size, tiny lump in her breast. And she called her doctor. She wasn't too concerned, you know, like most of us. Oh, it's just a this. Oh, it's just a that. Called the doctor and says, well, you know what? Why don't you just come in tomorrow and we'll check it out. And, you know, the process went and took place. And one thing led to the other thing, to the other thing. And here, this was a very aggressive form of cancer. Her doctor was extremely concerned. And, um, and, and we were at a pretty, around here for her, you know, a high level of, hey, we've got, a, we got an issue here. We've got, we've got a giant that's in our midst, and we've got to tackle this giant. And one thing I really appreciate about our secretary is that she's a very spiritual person. She immediately began speaking the word. She began confessing the word over herself. She read books, spoke scriptures on healing. Her and her mother took communion every single day. But not only did she do all the spiritual side of things, she also did the natural side. She took chemo. But she prayed every time she went down for that chemo. She didn't just go down there. She prayed and confessed the word. The chemo would only do what it was meant to do, that it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't damage at other parts of her body. She had surgery. Lord, let them only take what they need to take and let the surgeon, surgery be successful. And even had radiation. All through this test and trial, she was a woman of the word. She stood in faith. She took communion. She believed that she was healed. And praise God, she was healed. Cancer-free and has been cancer-free for years. And this is what was so even more exciting. When she was all done, supernaturally, someone paid off all her co-pays all her debt that was incurred from that sickness and that disease. Now, that is a miracle of God. But that's a great story of how we not only can flow in a natural stream, but we can flow in a supernatural stream. Paul had this to say to Timothy when he was going through some stomach issues. He says in 1 Timothy 5.23, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. The message says this. Go ahead and drink a little wine, for instance. It's good for your digestion and good medicine for what ails you. So Paul, remember Paul, we discussed, he wore aprons. He wore handkerchiefs. The power of God was so on him, they took those handkerchiefs and people were raised up and healed. Paul, who had the tangible anointing in his life, is telling Timothy, you're going to need to drink some wine to get rid of your stomach upset. You're going to need to drink some wine. I don't know. There might have been something in the water that was causing his tummy to be upset. But he told him, drink some wine. So again, we see a very natural element used with healing. Now, this I find is very interesting, and we're going to close here. It says this. On a September morning in 1928, Alexander Fleming sat at his workbench at St. Mary's Hospital after having just returned from a vacation from his country house with his family. Before he had left on vacation, Fleming had piled a number of his Petri dishes to the side of the bench so that Stuart Ard Craddock could use his workbench while he was away. Back from vacation, Fleming was sorting through the long, unattended stacks to determine which ones could possibly be salvaged. Many of the dishes had been contaminated. Fleming placed each of these in an ever-growing pile in a tray of Lysol. While sorting through his pile of dishes, Fleming's former lab assistant, Dr. Merrill Price, stopped by for a visit with Fleming. Fleming took his opportunity to gripe to him about the amount of extra work he had to do since Price had transferred from his lab. To demonstrate... Fleming rummaged through the large pile of plates he had placed in the Lysol tray and pulled out several that had remained safely above the Lysol. Had there not been so many, each would have been submerged in Lysol, killing the bacteria to make the plates safe to clean and then reuse. While picking up one particular dish to show price, Fleming noticed something strange about it. While he had been away, a mold had grown on the dish. That in itself was not strange. strange. However, this particular mold seemed to have killed the staphylococcus 
that had been growing in the dish. It was such a breakthrough that allowed two scientists 12 years later in 1940 to develop and put into production the medicine of penicillin. Now, this literally is a miracle. He, this man was just in a hurry throwing Petri dishes that had bacteria in it to the side so someone else could use his desk while he was on vacation. And while he was on vacation, somewhere a mold drifting through the sky <laughs> landed on the right Petri dish and began to eat and consume that bacteria. I don't think that was an accident. I believe it was the hand of God that brought forth penicillin. Do you know how many millions and millions and millions of people have been saved because of penicillin? The hand of God created what they call the miracle drug. It was a miracle drug, and it came from God. It isn't just by accident that something floats and ends up in a tiny little dish and ends up being discovered. I believe in this time that we need to ask the God of all creation, the miracle-working God, to bring some more miracle drugs into this world. We need a cure for coronavirus. We need vaccinations for coronavirus. And we need to stand and believe that our miracle working God is going to bring about some very natural elements for healing. Amen. You know, when, right before Jesus uh, was crucified on the cross, we know that he was betrayed by Judas and he was sold out for 30 pieces of silver. Matthew 25, 15 tells this. What, this is what Judas was saying. He says, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? And they set out for him 30 pieces of silver. And I think how the enemy, the, the devil at that time, must have thought, this was it. We're selling him out. It's over. But that transaction with that coins began to start a process of redemption, healing, and deliverance. My, my beloved friends, God wants you well. And God wants you healed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We have Pastor Mark who's with us, and he's going to share a couple things, and he's going to close us in prayer. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, everyone. It's great to see you. Just a couple of quick announcements I want to mention to you. Uh, for those of you in Weirton that are part of Berean, all of our small groups are going digital next week, and we'd love to have you connect with us via Zoom. It is a great way for you to connect right from your home, from your, uh, from your bedroom, from your sofa, whatever the case might be. So be looking at that email. We'd love to have you connect with that. Also, don't forget, not only Facebook Live, but our YouTube channel, that is Berean Fellowship Church-Pittsburgh. All of our teachings for Weirton are now going to be added to that and some other areas as well, uh, our, our overflow broadcast. And this coming Tuesday, do you want to mention that? This coming Tuesday, we have a special prayer meeting, if you want to just mention that. It's going to be on Zoom as well from 7 to 8 o'clock. We're going to be praying about the, the, the virus nationwide, even worldwide, also church needs as well. Yes, this Tuesday through Zoom at 7 p.m., we are going to join with the church movement called Unite 714. It's where um, Christians are praying at 714 p.m. and 714 a.m. about this coronavirus um, it's based off of Chronicles 714, which says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal the land. This is an awesome scripture because we don't have to rely on somebody else to do their job. We don't have to rely on the world to repent or to cry out. It's us, the church. We have to cry out and repent, and God will hear and God will heal the land. So starting this Tuesday at 7 p.m. through Zoom, we will send out uh, an email invitation. If you're not sure if the church has your email, please call the office, send it to us. We will add you to the list. And please join us. 
How much more? If one of us can put a thousand to flight, how much can two, tens of thousands, come and join together and let's together ask God. We need some breakthroughs here. We need to see this virus stop. We need that curve to bend. We want the curve to bend. We're tired of seeing it shoot up. It's time for it to come down in Jesus' name. Amen. You want to close us in prayer? Yeah, one more thing to mention. I know for the Bereans, some of you are looking to get your tithes in. For some of those of you just at the Bible study, maybe an offering, just remember this. There are four ways you can give even if we are not together physically. First of all, you can just mail it to the church. Secondly, you can arrange bill pay through your bank. That is free to you, and that is absolutely free to us as well. Also, you can text that information, and we have been sending, sending that information out to you. And lastly, you can go on our website, bereanfellowship.org. Just click on the giving tab, and you can give that way too. We want to speak God's blessing over you. Father, right now, for every person that is watching, we thank you for the various streams of healing. We speak healing into their lives we speak hope. We declare no fear here. We will not be afraid. We thank you, Lord, that your word says that you protect us from the plague even in our dwelling. So we thank you for divine protection. We thank you for divine healing. We thank you for supernatural provision. If someone has lost a job, if they've been downsized, if, if things are not coming in as quickly as normal, Father, we declare that you meet every need according to your riches in glory. So we speak provision right now, and we declare we are coming out on the other side better than ever. Thank you, Father. We are more than conquerors. We are victorious. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith in you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. We miss you. We miss getting to talk with you and hugging you. Connect with us via Facebook. Let, give us some comments. Let us know you're listening. And if we can do anything to help, please contact the church. We so miss being with you. Cannot wait to see you again physically. Stay plugged into the things of God. I believe this can be the church's finest hour. Have a wonderful week in Jesus. God bless you. God bless.